Hey, it's Jug. Yes. Looks and he's hit and dropped by Zach Moore. They go with Melvin oh, Gordon. Oh, what a hit. Pulls it down to run and gets leveled by Here's Daryl Stoneham. A return to kickoff for a touchdown. He's <laughs> in underneath and Worcester trying to get the first down will not, and that'll bring Kelly onto the field. Breyer having a uh, late lunch back oh. there, and then he just levels a hit. Think about a showdown next Saturday night. Oh, and he now on first and ten, plenty of time off the play action and the throw underneath. Like, no wasted motion in this guy. He doesn't look at that. Just flies to the ball. Postgraduate scholarship. Puts by A.J. Hawk. Really doing a nice job of orchestrating this offense. Quick pass. And another big hit. Nobody open. Oh, Doss. Just. Let's get it. And I don't think he's going to throw the ball as much as he thinks he's going to throw the ball. Now that Chip Kelly's in court. And I'm happy about that. More quarterback. Um. The truth is, Ryan Day has made a change philosophically, but it's none of those. You all know who wins. LSU is the drunkest fan base in the country. To start, that means we've got and welcome in. Thank you so much for joining me on a Tuesday here at Juck on Bucks. Appreciate you all so much. Our Buckeyes are back at practice today. They were off yesterday, so they moved into the team hotel. Today is practice number five of 25, so 20 more left. But keep in mind that that last week is a game prep week. So really just 15 more preseason practices left after today's. And uh, we're getting here. <laughs> it's coming. The season of dreams is almost upon us, and I cannot believe it. I embarked on this journey after the Missouri game to start my little show here. And talking about this every day, well, five days a week, sometimes six, has made this drag so long. <laughs> Like, I can't even tell you, but this is finally here, man. It's finally here. Uh, what else? The coaches poll came out, and we're going to go over that puppy. I got some recruiting thoughts, a couple of pieces of news on that. Um, the coaches poll, always kind of goofy. The fact that the coaches poll actually determined national championships for decades is pretty insane. The coaches don't vote in it, number one. Number two, even if they did, they don't watch other teams. Like they watch the team they're about to play. They don't got time to watch football games. It's kind of crazy, but we're going to go over it anyway. Uh, when the AP poll comes out, we'll devour that puppy a little bit, a little bit more because the AP poll, like it or not, that preseason AP poll still carries weight. It carries weight all through the beginning of the season, and it even carries weight up until we get to the committee. Like it, it just does. I know a lot of people cannot stand the preseason poll. You hear a lot of people get really angry about it for the first couple of weeks of the season every year, and I get it, but you know it is still kind of fun. When you watch those games early in the season, you do want to see those ranked matchups. You know, just it's more exciting when there's a number next to the team. It just is. A big Buckeye weekend for us is we got another decision coming, Messiah Del Home, and he is going to announce on Saturday which means we are going to get together right here at Chuck on Bucks like we always do when we got a, a commitment announcement. And we're going to either celebrate or, uh, you know, get really irritated and talk about something else. One way or the other, we're going to meet here. I don't know the time yet for Del Holmes' announcement, but I use it as an excuse to get together because I love doing my show, but I love those live shows even more. And I would like to do a lot more. The problem is I'm so backed up with work and then doing the show every day that uh, it's like, I just haven't had time, but I can't wait. So Saturday, we're getting together again, doing a live show. And I don't like to do the, the regular show on a live. I just like to get together and we see where it goes. And we always have a good time. Usually go for about two hours. So plan on popping in on Saturday for Messiah Del Home's commitment. And Messiah Del Home, of course, uh, borderline top 100, 247, top 200, 247 uh, composite safety out of Virginia. He's down to Virginia, Virginia Tech, Maryland, and Ohio State. And now that the Buckeyes obviously didn't get Trey McNutt, that's official. It's uh, it's going to be good news. Messiah Delhomme is going to be a Buckeye. I, I really believe that. But we got somebody else to talk about a little later on in the show. And 
you know, things might be trending good on the offensive line front. Let's hit on those freshmen real quick. So Jalen McClain, three-star safety, a guy that we were not really talking about a whole lot last cycle or when he committed or signed. Dude has come in like an absolute animal. Aggressive as hell, totally fearless. Love seeing that. Aaron Scott Jr., five-star cornerback, totally looks like the truth. And look at this guy's physique. I mean, he's already getting the body by Mick physique going on, man. That's a big, uh, big freshman for a cornerback. But totally living up to the billing, as is Bryce West, the other DB that was, uh, you know, pretty high profile recruit out of Glenville. He's really flashing. James Peoples, the running back out of Texas, was a top 125 recruit. And if you watched his high school film, you definitely expected big things out of him because he looks excellent. But he's certainly showing it early on at camp. What most people didn't expect was that the other freshman running back, three star Sam Williams Dixon, who was kind of a throw in at the end of the class, really, really making an impression on a whole lot of people. And that's great news because we're going to need them. We got four running backs, but there is a fifth freshman running back, walk on Rashid Cisse. This dude was the runner up for Mr. Ohio football last year, listed as a DB. He's out there playing running back incredibly productive high school career, but at like Muskingum or something, a really low, uh, low division in Ohio, put up incredible numbers, something like 40 some touchdowns his senior year, ran a sub 11 second, 100 meters. So the guys definitely got speed a little undersized compared to the prototype that the Buckeyes usually recruit at running back, which is, you know, that five ten to six foot range, 215 pounds. They all kind of fit that mold. Then we get two guys that are a little different. Peoples, a little bit smaller, a little bit more like a J.K. Dobbins size. And I like it, man. I, I like a small back like that. I like to mix it up. I, I'm kind of sick of this, this prototypical uh, cookie cutter, same size running back. It's just not as exciting. That's why I'm really in on Turbo Rogers, the uh, Alabama commit that I would really like to flip. A little bit smaller, really fast. But this CSA little bit of a smaller guy like that. We'll see what his speed looks like out on the football field. I'm excited, though, for a walk-on freshman. Not something that would usually get you jazzed. Ian Moore, Justin Fry's uh, big win last cycle. Top 200 overall recruit. Out of state. <clears throat> out of, pardon me. <clears throat> out of state offensive lineman. 6'6", 317 pounds. Definitely looking the part. So good for him. Obviously, we know J.J. and Edric Houston, the two highest-rated recruits in our class. They're killing it so far. Probably just a matter of time before Mylon Graham, the other five-star, gets that kind of acclaim, too. He's definitely looking – I mean, he looks like he's ready to go already. But so far, this freshman class, about half of them look like they're acclimating really well to their first camp. Happy to hear that. Haven't heard much about Peyton Pierce yet. Peyton Pierce, one of my favorites of that class. I'm a believer. Uh, this dude's a run-stuffing linebacker, and we're going to talk some more about those linebackers later on. But 6'1", 225 out of Lovejoy, Texas. Really like this guy. And really love his high school uniform. All right, let's get to our AP poll. Sorry. Let's get to our coaches poll. Not the AP poll. The AP poll next Monday. This is the coaches poll. And when we look at the coaches poll, the first thing that pops out to us is the first place votes. Georgia had 46, Ohio State had seven. I would have expected Ohio State to get more. We'll see what happens when the AP poll rolls out. Texas got one first place vote and one other team got a first place vote. Now, we know that generally coaches do not vote in this thing. They use one of their SIDs. Maybe sometimes they vote in the first one. Michigan got one first place vote. Now, I can kind of see Maybe some people might think, you know, they're the people who hoisted the trophy at the end of last year. So maybe it just feels right to them to give it to them until they lose a game. You could see that maybe somebody might have that point of view. Or it could just be the coach of that team. You never know. But when we look at the top four, nothing is different than most of the polls we see with Georgia number one, the Buckeyes number two, Oregon number three. And Texas, number four, earlier on in the spring, that Texas-Oregon, who was number three, kind of flipped back and forth. 
But now we're seeing it's Oregon number three pretty much across the board in all these guys that we see anymore. And when we look at the total points, you kind of got Georgia standing alone up there with the Buckeyes, eh, a decent clip behind. And then Oregon and Texas kind of bunched up after Ohio State. And after that, you got a big gap. And you go down to number five where you got Alabama and Old Miss. You could definitely make an argument for Old Miss ahead of Alabama. I think you could make an argument for Notre Dame ahead of both of them. Either way, I'm fine with that five, six, and seven. It's when you get to number eight that a lot of people, I think, are going to have an issue here. And that's the highest that, that they are on uh, just about any poll I've seen in quite a while. They're usually about 11. And the reason they're usually about 11 is because when you look at their odds in the schedule, you got a team that is going to be an underdog in three games this year against Texas, against Ohio State, and against Oregon. So most likely a three-loss team, which is obviously not the eighth-ranked team in the country. Penn State at number nine, Florida State at number 10. I think the team at number 11 should be ahead of eight, nine, and 10, and that's Missouri. Missouri bring, brings back Brady Cook, a whole slew of returning uh, starters over there, and a team that went... Uh, What'd they go? 11 and one last year, 12 and one and, and won the they won the Cotton Bowl. And boy, they won't let you forget it. Nor, nor will fans of other teams let us forget it. The amount of people that bring up that game to knock Ohio State. It's just it's unreal. It really is. As if they didn't notice when they watched that game, what happened with the quarterback situation there. However, I still think we could have won that game. Uh, if it weren't for the offensive line, ridiculous decision that was made. But whatever. The point is, that game catapulted me into starting my show, so I should really thank that game because I love doing my show. Anyway, Missouri at number 11. You got LSU at number 12, and that's kind of interesting. When we look at the odds, the Vegas odds for the playoff, let's pull those up for a second here. So these are the championship odds, and the championship odds, when you look at LSU, they're seventh in the odds to win the championship, and when you look at them in the playoffs, they're ninth in the playoffs. So seventh for the national championship, ninth for the playoffs, which means the coaches are a lot lower on them than Las Vegas. Okay, after LSU, we got Utah. The odds on favor to win the Big 12, a really good team. I love Kyle Whittingham. I love the Big 12. I love the teams at the top. I think this is going to be a really exciting race. Kansas State, Utah, Oklahoma State, Kansas, and Arizona. I think they all got a chance to win the conference. It's going to be a fun one, and I think whoever gets that by, they're going to be the fourth seed most likely. It'll be a dangerous team coming out of there. So Utah at 13, Clemson at 14. Last year, they started off in shambles, finished on a six-game winning streak, looked good towards the end of the year. Uh, you know, they might just be, might just look a whole lot better this year. They really might. We'll see if Klubnik learns how to play Tennessee at 15, Tennessee just is always like, you know, okay, we'll see what they do. Oklahoma at 16. And that's interesting. Vegas really down on Oklahoma. Oklahoma is, has a uh, seven and a half game win total, which means they're expected to lose at least four games and, you know, having them at 16. Interesting. We'll see. They start. I mean, they, they had a pretty good record last year. I think they were 10 and two, but not expected to fare well in the SEC. They got some offensive line trouble. We'll see what happens with them. K State at 17. Um, Going to be real interesting. And I think a lot of Buckeye fans will be checking out K State this year. Oklahoma State at 18. Mike Gundy, absolute stud, totally underrated. Since 2010, Mike Gundy has had eight, 10, plus win seasons. One of them is an 11 win season and two of them are 12 win seasons at Oklahoma state with Oklahoma and Texas in the conference. That's incredibly impressive to me. The guy's done a phenomenal job there at 19 Miami. Miami's going to win the ACC at 20 Texas A&M. Interesting. I mean, I think they're going to be better. Well, okay. This is what I thought. I thought they were going to be better than everyone expected with Mike Alco in his first year. 
Elko's a really good coach. Uh, but apparently everybody expects them to be better than I thought that they were going to be because to put them at 20, I don't think they ought to be ranked to start the season. We'll see what happens with them. I mean, they got some promise, but having them at 20 to start the season, also having them as just a uh, one point underdog to Notre Dame to start off the season, which that's going to be an awesome game. I can't wait for that one. Uh, we'll get to that. We got Arizona at 21. Noah Fafita is still there. T-Mac is still there. Kudos to those dudes for not transferring out when uh, Jed Fish left and, and went up to Washington. They'll be an exciting team to watch again. NC State, Dave Doran's done a great job recently with the program. Shout out Kentrell Reinhardt. Our, our dude from Columbus is going to be a going to be an NC State Wolfpacker. Um, USC, uh, the Big Ten's USC at number 23. They won't finish in the top 25, in my opinion. Kansas, 24. And Iowa rounds out the top 25. So that is our coaches poll. Anybody interesting receiving votes and the others receiving votes that we should mention here? We got Washington is the very next one up. That's pretty wild. Remember, guys, Washington with Jed Fish now, from the team that went to the national championship last year, brings back just two starters. That's wild. Just two. Actually, let me rephrase that. There are two starters from last year's team that are on the current team. I don't even think they're going to start. They might have zero returning actual starters in the starting lineup when they kick game one. That's pretty wild. So Washington, Louisville, Virginia Tech, and SMU are the next four out. All right, so about three months ago, I was trying to prove a point. And the point I was trying to prove was of the eight traditional blue bloods, Texas, who just lives off this name. This They're, they're not even the dad in the Oklahoma-Texas rivalry. Oklahoma's the dad in that rivalry. But for some reason, Texas is the one that gets all the pub. And they are one of the eight traditional blue bloods. My contention was of the eight traditional blue bloods, they are the lowest ranking blue blood. And I wanted to set out to prove that. So I went through and looked at all the lists of, of different categories of statistics that we could find. And I chose the 11 most pertinent statistics that I thought would apply to how we would judge a college football program as a whole. So national championships, all Americans, conference championships, Heismans, et cetera. And I picked out the 11 most pertinent ones. And then I took the eight traditional blue bloods, Ohio State, Michigan, Notre Dame, USC, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Texas, and Alabama. And I put next to their name where they ranked in each one of those 11 categories. And then I added them all up. And at the end, you wanted to have the lowest number, right? Because you want to be number one in every single category. So if you had 11, that meant you were number one in every category, you would be the winner. So I went on down the line with all those eight historical blue bloods. I did an episode about it. Uh, if I can figure it out, maybe I'll link it. If not, uh, it's... It says it says it in the description in my video category. Anyway, the point is this. It proved my point. Texas is, in fact, number eight out of eight of the historical Blue Bloods. Always overrated, always talked about so much better than they actually are. And today this article popped out by my favorite journalist, uh, 2023 College Football Journalist of the Year, as voted on by Juck on Bucks. Brad, what the hell's Brad's last name? What's Brad? Hang on, let me let me, let me check Brad's last name. <laughs> Never mind, it wasn't even by Brad. Um, I can't pronounce the dude's name. Uh, it is by Brad Crawford. Brad Crawford. So Brad Crawford writes this article: the ten most overrated teams based on their preseason poll ranking and how many spots they dropped all the way back to 1989. So if you were ranked at number 10 to start the season and you finish the season number 20, then you're minus 10 onto the next season. If you were ranked at 20 to start the season and you finish ranked at 10, then it takes you up, right? So all the way back 
1989, the top most overranked teams with the most overvalued teams, overhyped teams from the preseason poll to the end for the last 35 years. And at number 10 is Florida, which surprises me. They don't generally pop off the page as a team that's usually overranked in these preseason polls, but 71 total spots they dropped over the 35 years. So everybody off on Florida quite a bit, but not as much as LSU, who's number nine. Texas A&M, who's number eight. Michigan, who's number seven. No surprise there. They're generally overrated. Miami, number six. Of course, they are constantly rated higher than they finish. Notre Dame, number four. Obviously, we could have. Oh, I'm sorry. They're tied. Notre Dame and Florida State are tied at number four. Oklahoma at number three. That surprised me. Now, number two and number one. Um, I'm going to give you a second to guess. Number two is USC. Always, always ranked way higher than they finish in the beginning of the season. And number one is Texas, the lowest rated of the Blue Bloods. And if you've never heard me go over that uh, article before, or that, uh, that data that I compiled, a lot of people talk about kicking Nebraska out of the Blue Blood category. And to do that, you would need to kick out Texas first because Nebraska ranks ahead of Texas still after being down for 20 years in every category, every single one. So Nebraska stays unless Texas goes. Texas consistently the most overrated program in the country. A bunch of bums is what they are. I knocked their helmet off out west, out east. Now, guys, listen. I, this article came out, uh, Ross Bjork, man, Ross Bjork, th this dude loves to talk, doesn't he? So Ross Bjork talking to on three again, and Ross Bjork brings up, I talked about it about two months ago, stadium naming rights, the NCAA approved it and potential advertisement on jerseys. Now, two months ago, I absolutely flipped my lid, right? Um, probably an embarrassing segment kind of went off like, no, uh, absolutely not. This cannot happen. And here's the thing. When you look at, like, I love college football. I love football in general, the sport, but I love college football. And one of the things I love about it are the traditions. And when you look at stadiums, when you look at the NFL, I love the NFL. I'm wearing a brown sweatshirt right now. You know what I mean? We look at stadiums. When I was a kid and in Pittsburgh and in Cincinnati and in Cleveland, these big behemoth football and baseball dual sports stadiums, okay? You had the Browns and the Indians, right? The Steelers and the Pirates, the Reds and the Bengals. And then as time went on, you got sports-specific stadiums. And, and the cookie-cutter Cleveland Browns stadium came in 1998, 1989. And then this new era, you got these sweet stadiums in Vegas and uh, down in Atlanta. I was down there. You got the, the ring uh, HD TV. It's crazy. It's wild. And that's what you do in the NFL. You look at college and you look at Sanford Stadium. You look at Ohio Stadium. You look at Neyland, Beaver, Michigan. You look at all these places and you just see a relic from a bunch of people long since gone who loved that college and that football team just as much as you do and the beautiful architecture and the way they built stuff. And when I walk up to the rotunda at Ohio Stadium, it hits me in my bones and I know a lot of you feel the same way. And there's something about college football to me that's just different and it shouldn't be screwed with. And I understand that many of you could not possibly care less if they name the stadium the Pantene shoe. Okay. I get it. But some of us are your brothers and we really, really care. It means a lot to us. It means a lot to us. And it means maybe even more to some of us, particularly myself, 
if they put an advertisement on the most beautiful jersey in the history of college sports or any sport, it could be more beautiful if Ross Bjork would work on getting us back our gray sleeves instead of trying to raise more money for the richest athletic department in the country. Mind you, I've got no problem with that rich athletic department. I scratch checks to that rich athletic department and that NIL department. No problem at all. But I'll tell you something. It's his job to do this, to try to raise money in every avenue he can. That's his job. He's good at it. That's why we brought him in, right? It's our job to tell him when he's pushing too far in a certain area. And buddy, I draw the line at putting a patch on the jersey. Now, I've heard some people make the argument, if it's just one, that's okay. All right, fair enough. You're a human being. You're quite familiar with human nature. That money comes in for that one patch. That feels good. That feels good for about three years, and then what? Well, now, now you're used to it. Now you want a little more, and you remember how easy it was to get that patch put on. Maybe you sell another one. Okay, you sell another one. And this time, the fans who might have fought you the first time, they're broken down a little bit because they lost the first battle. Then you win that second one a little easier. Uh, where does it stop? They're not going to sign a contract with us that it's just going to be that one. Like, I don't want one. I'm just saying, like, if that's your argument, like, okay, but just one. That's not the way things work. You know that. Think. Come on. That is not the way this works. This is this is horrible to me. I, I, I get that some of you don't care, but I just want you to think about those of us that do. You know what I mean? Like, we're your brothers, man. We, we care. Like, this means a lot to me. I don't want that. I, I really don't want that. And the last time I talked about that, there's a whole lot of us, and the whole lot of us tend to skew a little older and a little stodgier, and a little more traditional. I get it. But again, this is the richest athletic department in the country. Okay? Everything's just fine. And I promise you, when they want to build something, I get the email. They want money. And if they screw around with that jersey, I'll never scratch another check again. Never. Straight up, never. And I will encourage everyone I talk to who is a booster as well to never scratch another check ever straight up. They will take as much as you allow them to. And I don't just mean Ohio state. I mean, every entity like that, that is serving the public will take just as much as you allow them to. And you got to make it clear. Okay, listen, we're here for you getting more money in the university. We like that. That's all good. In fact, the more money you can raise in ways like that, the less you need to ask me to donate next time you do a project, right? Unfortunately, that's not the way that works either. It doesn't matter how much they make. They still come to the donors when they want to build something. You just got to tell them when they've gone a little too far. This idea, no thanks. You put safe light on the field, be happy with that. I don't want to be wearing a shirt in 20 years that says, I still call it the shoe. My absolute Favorite football player in the class of 2026 is the number one linebacker in the country, the number one player in Georgia, Tyler Atkinson. There's a lot of guys who are at more important positions than linebacker, but this guy is my absolute favorite. And I've played his film on here a lot of times. As good as Riley Pettijohn and TJ Alfred are, Tyler Atkinson is in an athletic category by himself. He's the absolute perfect modern age linebacker at 62205 the film you're watching is a sophomore at a big time georgia high school absolutely dominating he looks like he's at one and a half speed great instincts always 
he works so hard. This dude's got great numbers on the weights, constantly tweeting out videos of him working out. As we enter this year, the first year that we have a really athletic linebacker room in quite some time, I think we're going to see a big difference. And with guys in the pipeline, like Arvell Reese, like Riley Pettijohn, TJ Alford, and yes, even Eli Lee, and some of you will laugh, Eli is a much better athlete than Tommy Eichenberg, who he's often compared to. It's not even close. He's a verified 6'3", 230, squats more than 90% of the current Ohio State roster right now at 17 years old, and he sees everything everybody says. And I'll tell you straight up, keep it coming, because that dude has a chip on his shoulder. James Laurinaitis has already proven right out of the gate that he's an ace recruiter, landing his top two targets in the class in his very first time being able to go travel, and he did it on a short cycle. Pretty amazing. Can he pull the number one player out of Georgia? A player that Georgia is on and on big? One thing in our favor is Atkinson is from a place that my buddy from Georgia calls Yankeeville, so that helps a little bit. I guess Georgia doesn't have the greatest uh, recruiting prowess in this particular county. His top three schools right now, he released his top 10, but his top three are Georgia, Auburn, and Ohio State. Hugh Freeze, he's recruiting this cycle right now all of a sudden like he did that one year at Ole Miss when he got himself in trouble and uh, straight up cheated his keister off. But nowadays, what he was doing then is not cheating. Tyler Atkinson has been to Georgia seven times now. He's been to the Tigers about a half a dozen times. Been to Ohio State three times from Georgia. He's planning on returning to Ohio State for a game day. He said he wants to experience a game when it's cold because he wants to see what all the cold talk is about, wants to feel it himself. Obviously, people trying to negatively recruit against, uh, negatively recruit against him coming up to Ohio State. But he talked this week after whittling his list down, and he said his visit to Auburn was for Big Cat Weekend, and it was very good. We'll talk about Auburn in a minute here. But he said he got to spend some time with Hugh Freeze at Georgia. He likes Coach Kirby Smart and Glenn Schumann, very close with a lot of the players. Of course he is. When he goes to Georgia, most of the defense already knows who he is because he's been there so much. Ohio State, he says, I like the coaches up there. I like Coach James Laurinaitis, and Coach Ryan Day is a good person. I like the vibe up there. I like the scheme. When I go up there, I talk ball with them. They have good players. They're trying to win it all this year, and there's high energy up there, and that's why I like it every time I go up there. He had more to say about Ohio State than anybody else. He was with Jakeem Stewart and Chris Henry Jr. in that Instagram a couple weekends ago, talking about Buckeye Class of 2026, where Jakeem Stewart was wearing his Buckeye gear. The kid really loves Ohio State, and uh, it would be something you know when we talk about the difference sometimes we recruit at the same level as georgia and alabama but we always struggle in a couple of positions one is that huge one tech that just big nasty malik autry the guy we're trying to flip from auburn and that's that's curtains that's over now but we struggle at that position that they always seem to get. The second is Georgia usually has these crazy linebackers that they seem to grow in Georgia. We get one every now and again. But not the ones on this level usually. Uh, this is just a different level. And this, this would really be something. But I'm bringing this up because we're, we're heading into recruiting now. Just for a second here. Um, there's been a lot of talk all of a sudden about Josh Petty. Now, Josh Petty, five-star interior offensive lineman from Georgia, small school Georgia ball, not a very big guy. He only weighs about 265, 6'4", but he's going to grow into it. More like a lineman that the Buckeyes usually recruit than Georgia, but Georgia did recruit him pretty hard. Kirby landed his helicopter on his football field. And about the time he did that, I figured that the Buckeyes were totally out of this. But Georgia didn't even make his Final Four. His Final Four consisted of Ohio State, Florida State, Georgia Tech, and Tennessee. Tennessee again. But Tennessee not in his top three. His top three 
is Florida State, Ohio State, and Georgia Tech. Thought forever to be a big-time Florida State lean because his sister goes to Florida State and he said he wants to get a good education and go to the NFL. Ohio State beats, Georgia, or beats Florida State in both of those categories. But recently, it is thought that now this is a Georgia Tech and Ohio State battle by a couple of big shots, Steve Wiltfong among them. I'm not sure how much I buy it or how much they're trying to poke the Ohio State bear for clicks like they do sometimes, but he announces next Monday, and I certainly love the fact that they're really, really trying, but I hope that that doesn't have to do with them thinking they're going to lose on David Sanders because as much as we hear about David Sanders and it not going good, nothing's really happened other than he went down to visit Tennessee on the weekend that we didn't hold anything on the big visit weekend. He went there. And we've heard things come from that visit that, you know, they made some bigger or uh, or more difficult offer to match. Not quite sure what that entails. Maybe some housing or something like that. I don't know. But nothing's really changed. So while everybody thinks the momentum is all swung to Tennessee, I'm not so sure. And I'm not going to jump to any conclusions or be defeatist about it until we hear it. And we'll hear it in under two weeks now. But my hope is that the Buckeyes aren't pushing really hard on Josh Petty. And this is their backup plan because they know Sanders isn't coming. But if they're able to get themselves back in the game here and they can get Petty, who, by the way, I think only came up once. I got to double check that. But I know he came up for his official visit. He just recently visited Florida State and Georgia Tech again. It just never seemed like this was going anywhere. So I'm happy that they're really pushing hard. That's great. Other than that, still not a single word about anything about Javon McFadden. That is the Maryland offensive lineman, three-star guy that is the other guy in the fold besides David Sanders and potentially Josh Petty if he really is in the fold or not. And again, we'll find that out on Monday and we'll be here live to do it unless, you know, I hear between now and then that it's a bunch of gobbledygook. Because sometimes they play us, you know what I mean? You say Ohio State, those recruiting guys, and they know that that we'll come swarming and, and check out what they got to say. But it wasn't on the thumbnail of the video and it wasn't in the title of the article. So usually when it's clicky like that, they'll definitely put Ohio State in that title. It could be for real. And I got to tell you, th this guy, he's the real deal. It would be one heck of a consolation prize to missing out on Sanders. Not the same stratosphere, but nonetheless, it's a five-star out-of-state guy and uh, a big, big win for Justin Fry if he can pull it off, for sure. Absolutely would get huge props. And then you just have to wonder, what took you so long to, to turn up the heat on him? And how are you able to pull this off in so little time with this guy? And I, I don't mean it's so many questions for this guy. But the point is, it just might be some positive momentum trending for Josh Petty. And we are 100% going to go live on Monday to check that out. So Monday the 12th, checking that out. Saturday, this upcoming Saturday, don't know the times for either of them. But Messiah Del Home this Saturday, uh, I, we haven't had a live in a while. I can't wait. Honestly, I would like to pop up and, and, uh, and do one between now and then. So really excited about that. At Big Ten Media Days, Spencer Holbrook of Letterman Row asked Steve Wiltfong about Naeem Offord. And at the time, remember that was just a couple weeks ago, Steve Wiltfong said, I think it would be really difficult for somebody to flip him. Naeem Offord went to Big Cat Weekend at Auburn, which is the gathering that they held on the big weekend where we didn't hold anything. Not the first time he's been there recently. He's been there quite a bit lately. And now Wilt Fung's changing his tune. He's talked to some people behind the scenes, and he thinks Auburn is a real player here to flip Naeem Offord. And this is the same exact thing they said about Alabama 
when he was putzing around on their campus, like five out of 10 days or something. He's, uh, he's not going to either of those schools. He's locked into Ohio State. He's locked in with Tim Walton, and there is nothing to fear there. He's just enjoying himself this summer. And Malik Autry, the Auburn One Tech that we were trying to flip, is working on Naeem Hard, but he's not coming here. Malik Autry, Naeem is. Malik Autry has been actively recruiting and celebrating as Auburn has landed prospect after prospect and climbed their way to the number five class in the country. And uh, they're looking for more. They're owning the state of Alabama, absolutely owning it. Let me pull that sucker up here. Take a look at what Auburn is doing versus the University of Alabama. So here we go. Alabama, we've got nothing but Auburn, a couple of Buckeyes, and Anthony Turbo Rogers at the bottom. Committed to Alabama for now. Buckeyes coming hard. We'll see. But I want to know what our Alabama buddies think of this. Uh, a really nice year for uh, in-state talent in the state of Alabama. And Auburn is absolutely crushing the Tide. The Tide just have three guys from in-state. Uh, what's the deal? I mean, obviously, Tide got a great class going on. Do you not like homegrown talent down there? Because there is some serious talent in the state of Alabama this year. But when we look at the board here, we got Buckeyes, Bama, Georgia, LSU, Auburn, and Oregon. Oregon jumps from 11 up to 6 after getting their quarterback and Trey McNutt. Miami creeps into the top 10. And that is Turbo Rogers, who we're trying to flip. I think it's a real long shot, but I do think that Carlos Lachlan is going to get him up for a visit. For a game, we'll see what happens. But Hugh Freeze is killing it. Auburn is killing it out of nowhere ever since they had that big cat weekend. The interesting thing is a lot of these guys were flips. And before that big cat weekend, he was pounding his chest saying he was about to get a bunch of flips. And he did. He did it. It's pretty impressive. Hugh Freeze is not a head coach who uh, stands back and lets his guys recruit. He's in there. He's in there. So. Pretty cool. Pretty cool for them. I really, uh, every year when we look at the, the top talent in the country, you look at the five stars, there's eight to 15 guys in a given class that are next level to me. This year it goes to 11. There's 11 guys in this class that I think are different from the rest of the guys. And after those 11, for me, it's about top 100 players. From 11 to 100, those guys are essentially interchangeable and just about personal preference, uh, positional preference, and these guys all kind of piggyback off each other in the way they slot those top 100 players. So I judge a class as high-end talent by how many top 100 players they got. And when we look at these top six recruiting classes in the country, Ohio State, Alabama, Georgia, LSU, Auburn, and Oregon. I just want to highlight how dominant this Buckeye coaching staff has been here. Number of top 100 players in these classes. Oregon has five. Auburn has five. LSU has six. Georgia has five. Alabama has seven. And Ohio State has 11. It's fantastic. A couple of weeks ago, I said I thought that uh, Zaheer Mathis was maybe slightly more than a coin flip odds to flip to Penn State. He had taken official defense, taken an official to Penn State, taken another visit to Penn State. He's got three teammates going to Penn State. He's from Pennsylvania. They're pushing hard for him, and it looks more and more like that's definitely going to happen. So when that happens, we're losing a top 100 player and we're losing an edge rusher, which leaves really only Zion Grady as the only edge rusher in that class, as London Merritt, kind of a tweener. 
Um, his skill set is not really that of a true edge. That's kind of an issue. That's kind of an issue. Don't know what we're going to do from there or uh, who we're going to try to flip. Real bummer that we didn't go a little bit harder on Marion Dye or uh, Damian Shanklin in Indiana, who both went to SEC schools, and Dye went to Tennessee, Shanklin went to LSU, or is going to LSU. So that's a bit of a bummer. I thought we had the inside track on Dye, and it just didn't seem like we pursued it hard enough. But anyway, guys, practice um, resuming right now. We'll get some details on that a little later. Let's, uh, we'll have Dylan on probably Thursday, Thursday. We'll get Dylan back on and let's go over a couple of comments and news and notes, uh, for this stupid documentary with Connor stallions, they released a little trailer today and Portnoy's in it. So it's super, super serious. You got Portnoy in it. Also, the Oregon mascot, the duck, has been going around to all the college campuses in the Big Ten, going out in front of the stadiums. He went to Illinois and tried to climb the gate, went to Northwestern where they're building the new stadium, and it's just, you know, it's empty right now, and he's standing there, whatever, taking some funny shots, trying to trying to just get some more pub out for uh, for the ducks coming to the Big Ten. And then he went to Indiana. And he laid on Hep's rock and got himself a picture. Uh, the only issue with this is that rock is named Hep's rock after a coach that died of brain cancer. And the duck is, is laying on top of the rock. Uh, a lot of folks think that's a little disrespectful. So not the best look for the duck right there. A couple of pictures of Petty from his official. Josh Petty, the five-star offensive lineman from Georgia, standing there with the, the guy who owns the record for the most all-time starts in the history of Indiana Hoosier football, Justin Fry. Yerky says, you're mad, face it. We're beating that case. <laughs> this this you're mad thing has been throwing around, like it's thrown around a lot as though this is some kind of... Uh, I don't know, insult. You're you're damn right I'm mad. What like, what gave it away? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I am mad. Exactly, exactly right. This is a buddy of ours from Oregon, one of the Duck Eye crew, and he said it's called astroturfing. Oregon started this media campaign like a couple of weeks ago, and it's pretty cringe how they're getting it to trying to get it to catch on. Now, number one, thank you. Uh, he taught me a term, so I went and looked that up, astroturfing. And basically what this is, I played that video with Dan Lanning. And he's making that video, and he says, you know, they talk about the team out west. That is not a thing. Nobody's ever talked about that. And what this astroturfing term means, i got to look it up again. Hang on. Let me forget to. Like, I know what it is, but it's hard to explain. I got I to gotta look at it. Hold on. Let me, I want to make sure that I get this. Here we go. Organized activity. This is astroturfing. Organized activity that is intended to create a false impression of a widespread, spontaneously arising grassroots movement. Right? So, Lanning gets on there and says this comment. You know, they talk about the team out west. Nobody said that. But if you're watching that and you hear that, you're like, oh, do people say that? And he's saying that they started this campaign two weeks ago and they've been dropping this and making it sound, trying to push this term, making it sound like this is a real term that people have been using when they made the thing up and they're trying to push it out in, in this astroturfing campaign. Um, so I appreciate you teaching me what astroturfing was. Uh, I think that that's awesome. and. He finds it cringe as well as an Oregon fan. And that's why I enjoy talking to other college football fans who are honest, right? I can say straight up when I look at Ryan Day in the middle of that huddle and he's bouncing around between the guys on the field, that's super cringe, bro.
I can say that about my football team. He can say that about his. There's really only one sect of fans that has an issue saying anything is wrong with their program. Just one. And those are the ones I don't like to deal with, like this one. Never seen a fan base so pathetic. That's it. We'll just leave it at that. Um, this fan base is pathetic. Not the ones that have buried their heads in the sand. And now you see everything and you still want to pretend like nobody knew. Okay. We're the pathetic ones. Ron Thompson says, I don't care about the punishment. I care about the scarlet letter they have. And yeah, that's, that's my deal, Ron. That's my deal too. I care about the scarlet letter and uh, they're wearing it and they don't even know it. So good stuff. Anyway, guys, that'll do me for um, no show tomorrow, but we'll be back on Thursday. And I believe that we'll be back with Dylan. So can't wait to uh, see what he's got to say after his uh, trip out to the Woody for uh, interviews with some quarterbacks. And I believe there's going to be full pads on Thursday as well. So. There is no show tomorrow scheduled, but may pop on and do a live. So set your alarm bells and uh, please check me out on podcast. Please like the video while you're here. We've been having some really nice numbers and I want to thank all the new folks that have given us a shot. Appreciate you guys so much. Uh, hope you stick around and, uh, you know, I try to do better every day. So, uh, you know, stick with me. I've improved a lot. I promise. Month three, I, I was terrible and slowly a little bit better each month. Month one, boy. It was rough. So anyway, guys, appreciate you. Talk to you soon. Chuck and Bucks out.